Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Amrobat Mili. I'm the CTO and co founder of Big Stream Solutions, in which I work on advanced compiler and runtime technologies to accelerate big data application with zero code change using accelerators. The other author is Jong Se Park, who is a primary developer of DNN Weaver. We're going to be, you're going to be learning more about that technology today, who's not present today. And the third speaker. Um, I'm Blake Skinner. I'm a product engineer at Bigstream. Um, I work on the Spark and our accelerator interfaces. I would like actually to thank Databricks and Spark Summit for the great opportunity for us to be here and talking to you. So today we're going to be talking about real-time DNN acceleration in order to speed up your big data applications. So, okay. so before starting, let me actually give you a quick overview of our technology and our mission at Bigstream. At Bigstream, our mission is to bridge the gap between big data applications and accelerator of technologies available in data centers and cloud systems, such as FPGAs, GPUs, or many cores. And the way it works, the data scientists or DevOps people run their application on the cluster without changing any code, just they enable our technology, and we automatically observe the application, and at runtime, we convert the application, or we run analysis, we optimize the application in flight, again, without any code change. And our technology is not invasive at all. So you just enable a couple of uh, libraries, and that's it. So depending on what kind of accelerators you have available, either it's FPGA or GPU, this convert, this, this speed up or, or optimization happens in the flight automatically. Even if you don't have any accelerator, we still give you acceleration in the flight just running on CPUs. Depending on your workload, we may deliver 2x to 30x acceleration across the entire cluster. The key here, again, is there is no code change. The user doesn't have to change their code. It's all automatic. OK. For today's talk, we're going to talk about ingest bottleneck in big data applications. There are many big data applications that are dealing with severe ingest bottlenecks. And it's not getting better in any way. In particular, the type of big data applications that are dealing with media raw data, such as surveillance cameras, voice recognition, and fraud detection. Many of these applications actually, in order to be effective, they re really require to be able to do near real-time analysis. And given how the data is growing for this type of applications, that's becoming impractical soon or even right now. As an example, a 4K camera can produce something close to five terabyte of data per hour. So if your cluster is actually processing the data from 1,000 cameras, you're dealing with five, terab five petabyte of data in an hour. And you can imagine the total amount of data in the long run is just not going to be scalable at all. Now, there is a sort of a traditional architecture here. I'm going to just explain the journey of data throughout the cluster in different phases. We start with your IoT devices like cameras that are sending raw frame, raw images inside your cluster. Usually, if you want to do near real-time analysis, first you have to send your raw data to your streaming cluster, such as Kafka. This is stage one. It's the ingest stage as your data enters your cluster. Once the data is in your cluster, the next step is actually Kafka sends your streaming da data. Actually, data is streamed from Kafka to your Spark cluster. We call it data streaming as stage two. Once your data receives your computational cluster, which is like Spark cluster, there Spark actually decodes your Kafka messages, extract your frames, and apply some online analytics, such as um, anomaly detection or cross-camera re-identification of the people. 
around in the area, right, coming from different cameras, right, across camera, um, or detection or tracking of movement of the people, right? We have seen many, many talks in today and yesterday's session about all of these use cases. Finally, after you're done with online analysis, you may want to store your data for future offline analysis, like model training or, um, or data cleaning in the future for training your models, basically. Now, there is a problem here. There's a big problem here. When your data, we're talking about raw images that are growing, that basically is very inefficient across the entire pipeline. First of all, you're sending large images to a Kafka. Kafka, basically, as it queues messages behind the scene, is, is using file system for keeping track of them and recording them, right? So basically, you're going to have an explosion um, right in the first stage in your cluster. Again, you're sending the same messages, bulky messages, from Kafka to your Spark cluster, and decoding and doing analytics becomes even harder because now you're dealing with raw data being decoded, applying complicated machine learning algorithms or image processing algorithms. So, and eventually offline analytics is also hard because you're eventually gonna put all of these chunky data on your valuable resources. And if you look at this, this problem with ingest is going to affect the efficiency of your entire cluster. What you really care about is your online analytics or real-time analytics and your training um, in the same cluster, but given that you're dealing with a major ingest problem, you're pressuring all of these valuable uh, resources in a cluster, slowing down all of these, making, making this problem almost impractical. In a cluster like this, you really want to be able to easily, in a near real-time fashion, answer interesting use cases like this, like how many people in a period of time moved from department A to department B, or how many people were gathered around the building in a particular amount of, in a particular period of time. Uh, and all of these actually requires a lot of complicated image processing analysis, in particular cross-camera um, re-identification of people and tracking, um, image detection, and, and many complex anal analytics. Now, the problem is you're dealing with a lot of ingest bottleneck. So, again, summarizing the problem and actually showing the type of good analysis that you should be able to, to do in order to be able to come up with real-time queries for these type of systems, but it's impractical in action. Now, the idea here that we're going to be proposing is what if you can use DNNs as compression devices? DNNs are used for image processing a lot these days, right? And uh, basically what they do, if you look at them in terms one of one way to look at them, they're converting your raw data into condensed semantic data, which is much, much more compressed. Instead of sending the entire image, you can imagine sending bounding boxes and labels or other important uh, image features. In our observation, the amount of reduction of data you can get is in the range of 5x. Now, again, to summary, image processing pipelines are complicated given how much ingest of the data you will be facing that pressure your ETL tool chain and you're spending a lot of resources on storing raw data and managing raw data across the entire uh, phases of your data processing. Now, the idea here is what if you could actually move your DNN processing outside your data center or your cluster, move it closer to the edge where your IoT messages are being injected into your system, and you are going to end up with a small cluster of DNA nodes, and as your images, for example, here are coming in, you are going to apply your DNA computation right in that area, like we can call it fog or 
um, close to edge. And what is going to be actually injected as your ingest to your streaming cluster is actually image features, uh, which is going to be a lot more condensed. Now, your cluster is facing a lot less load in terms of ingest and storage. And you can actually spend more resources on your useful online analytics or offline batch level analytics, right? And the other thing is that if you don't want to do that, you can actually scale down your cluster, shrinking the number of nodes in your cluster. So basically, you're saving a lot on your infrastructure. Now, you might think basically what happened is that you actually move the bottleneck from within the cluster to outside the cluster, and it's not actually fixing the main problem. You still know that DNNs are pretty computationally expensive, and they, re they need a lot of, they take a lot of data and energy to run, and you're still facing a bottleneck right there. Now, at Bigstream, we believe FPGAs are good candidates for accelerating DNNs and resolving some of these problems. Basically, FPGAs are much faster than CPUs, they're a lot more power efficient than GPUs, and they're a lot more programmable than ASICs. Uh, the problem, though, with FPGAs is that they need hardware description languages to program them. So for someone who is writing their models in TensorFlow or PyTorch, you don't expect them to actually use Verilog or VHDL to convert, I mean, to, to write them for FPGA or program FPGAs. And this is true. So our solution is a full solution for combining DNN and FPGAs for ingest to reduce the bottleneck in ingest. And for programmability problem, we have this product called DNN Weaver, which basically is a compiler and full stack for complete automation of DNN acceleration, meaning that the data scientists can write their program in TensorFlow or PyTorch. They don't have to change any line of code or many modification, any complex tool chain, and it automatically um, can be run on FVGA, and it's all automatic, right? There is no uh, major bottleneck. And it can be deployed very with minimal infrastructure and make the architecture that we just proposed a reality. So I'm going to now pass it to Blake. He's going to actually give you more details on DNN Weaver and the proposed architecture for um, Spark Weaver. <laughs> I, uh... So thank you. Um, so as mentioned, DNN Weaver is a tool that's designed to ease the deployment of deep neural networks to FPGAs. Um, so it supports TensorFlow and Onyx currently. Um, and you know, with no code changes and without hardware expertise, you can compile your deep neural network into a bit file, which can be uploaded to an FPGA. Now, this is based on some, res um, some research work. There's papers published on it um, and an open source implementation available. Um, at Bigstream, we're excited to be working on an enterprise implementation, which has improved performance and additional features that we're excited to um, make more announcements about soon. So just a big picture of the FPGA, of the Dan and Weaver flow. So you send in a design with TensorFlow and Onyx. Um, it goes through several steps involving translating, um, design planning, um, and it, takes, um, it also takes as input um, hand-optimized templates and a memory interface. Um, these are distributed with DNN Weaver. They wouldn't necessarily have to come from your team. Um, and when you get a final output, um, it's an FPGA binary, a bit file that's ready for upload. Um, so the goal of the DNN Weaver project was to create a stack for um, implementing DNNs on FPGA, similar to what already exists for GPUs and CPUs. Um, so it involves a custom IR, a custom compiler, um, and an ISA. So um, you know, um, if you're interested, I'd encourage you to um, look at the original research work on this and our upcoming announcements. Um, but we want to go back to Spark Weaver um, and the architecture that we're proposing and look at how it can make those use cases that we discussed a reality. Now, 
so here is the Spark Weaver architecture, um, similar to the one that we showed before, but now the neural networks have been replaced by FPGAs because that's what they're going to be implemented on. Um, and so then it's still sending features um, into the rest of the cluster. Now, the use cases involve um, image processing, and so we're going to talk a little about the neural networks that were used to implement this. Um, so for the, exa for the example, the demo that we're going to show, um, we used two um, neural network architectures. Um, YOLO, which is a rather popular um, what, uh, neural network out for detection. If you haven't looked at it, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and what it can do is take in image frames and output um, bounding boxes around objects like people, food, bowls, other things like that. Um, so that will give you detection in a single frame, but if you want to track people across multiple frames, you need more. Because as, um, as we all know, if someone is standing completely still, their pixels will be a little bit different from one frame to another. If they're moving, they'll be even more different. Um, Deep Sort can take in detectors, um, can take in bounding boxes from a detector, and it's compatible with almost any type of detector, um, and assign tags to them, which will translate across frames. So it can tell you that the woman walking, it's frame, you know, it's ID 129, and that will track, you know, across multiple frames. So now how we would deploy these two algorithms in our Spark Weaver architecture, um, you see we've got detection um, running on the FPGAs, and then we're doing tracking in our cluster. So some um, specific details, what's going on, to, to recap, um, we're streaming video from cameras, um, and then our FPGA clusters will um, implement a YOLO, specifically a version two, there's several versions of it, um, um, using DNN Weaver, and then we stream um, the image features, only what's needed by Deep Sort, to the Kafka server, um, which can then be aggregated for all sorts of offline and online um, analytics. So just some really preliminary numbers just on our internal data set um, that we're prepared to release now. Um, we ran just on a single node um, using the normal architecture. And so this required the normal architecture to run everything, our Kafka, our Spark, the neural networks. And we were getting 7.3 frames per second. Um, however, with the Spark Weaver architecture, we got 12.8 um, using, you know, without modifying the code at all, using just the um, vanilla implementations of these neural networks. So to shed a little bit of light on the difference, um, we ran the single node, we ran the traditional architecture with only the detection part and only the tracking part. And essentially what happens now that they're running in parallel, the, um, the, the speed is determined by the slower of those two parts, which is tracking. Um, running YOLO on our FPGA was a little bit higher, and so now our overall um, the frame rate of our Spark Weaver architecture is now higher. So we have an upcoming release um, in um, upcoming release this year um, with improved performance, and this is what we've been projecting with our internal data sets, and we hope to release more numbers and more concrete numbers soon. Um, but we've um, um, but this is this is what we're projecting. Um, and so the other metric that we wanted to look at, of course, is compression, um, because, of course, that's one of the main goals of this. And using, um, and on our data set, um, on our internal data set, and we'll show a small demo of it working as well, we were getting roughly 5.5x, 5 .5 82%. Um, the reason for this, of course, is that you, only, you don't need the whole frame anymore. You really only need what's in the box um, and, you know, the locations of the box. And so, you know, you have a vast reduction amount in the amount of data that you actually need to send into the cluster in order for this to work. So we have a short demo here we'd like to show. This is just some people in our office, you know, and it running, um, you know, tracking people across frames. Um, we hope to have, you know, more, more soon. Um, you know, we're very excited about this project. Um, for the last section of this talk, though, um, I want to just talk a little about the streaming and batch analytic operations that um, we've been, um, that are capable, that are enabled by this, especially in relation to the use cases we discussed earlier. Um, now, of course, um, these type of, um, th these type of, uh, this type of analysis and um, the use cases, this requires even more than just YOLO and Deep Sword. This requires the ability to re-identify people across multiple cameras, um, and that involves, um, that's a very hot area of research, and involves, um, you know, a, a lot of aggregation and similarity vectors. Um, 
and such. Um, and then, of course, anomaly detection. There was another talk um, at this conference, which was very interesting, about detecting um, suspicious activity in videos. Um, and the, the point is that all of these require a lot of aggregation and a lot of analytics, which is going to be required, which, which is what requires Spark or some similar mechanism. Now, the use case one, um, it was how many people went from one department to another. Um, so here, you know, we could just run some, um, so once you have the infrastructure set up um, and you're able to reliably do the person, uh, reliably able to identify people both within one camera and across cameras, you can, um, it, it's rather easy to aggregate together this table that I've depicted on the um, top left, which um, would list a unique ID for a person. We don't know who they are, but we know a unique ID for them. Um, a camera ID, since we have multiple cameras, and, a pretend, and when they enter and exited the view. Now, if we want to know if they were seen in two departments, you know, we can just run some queries. We could do some selects. Um, I use a UDF within threshold, which would, um, which is based on how long if they took kind of a direct route. You know, they were walking from one camera to another. Of course, there's a lot of little details in getting this type of a system working well. So, you know, and I can't cover all of them in this talk, but. Um, you know, once you have a, this kind of a system running reliably, it can start to answer these types of questions. Um, the second use case, um, people walking around a building, which has an obvious application to security and marketing. Um, and so here, it's again, it's just a lot of aggregation. Um, once you have the people, once you know um, where the people were present and which cameras, you could start um, seeing, you know, when they were seen within this camera. Maybe you want to look at specific orderings and other things. You know, there's you know, just a lot of interesting things you can do with this type of architecture. Um, so in conclusion, um, DNN optimized ingest, we really feel like this is the direction things are going. Um, you know, more and more data is coming in, more and more DNNs are being used. You know, the number of cameras and the quality is not going to decrease. Um, and so, you know, this is really a type of smart compression. I mean, compression is already very common in the big data realm. So, you know, but this is another level of it. Um, and it's using the neural network to find what the data that you really need. Um, and then what this means is that your network resources, um, power, storage, processing, it's being spent on condensed, highly meaningful data rather than raw data, which, as we know, is, is very sparse. Um, and FPGAs um, are a great solution for this kind of edge computing because they're highly parallel, though they're more power efficient than other options, um, and they can be deployed with much more, with minimal resources. Um, and then using DNN Weaver, you could just take TensorFlow and Onyx designs you know, and directly write them to FPGAs. Um, and then the final point, and this is something that you know, many talks at this conference that deal with ML stuff um, talk about, which is that it's not, to create an enterprise level application, it's not just the neural networks, it's also the infrastructure. You know, need um, logging, monitoring, verification, um, all sorts of analytics that you're going to want to do that are both online and offline. I mean, just moving the data between the clusters. Um, that to deploy this kind of thing at the enterprise scale, you really need something like Spark. Um, and, you know, that's that's clear to a lot of people, I think. So, um, you know, thank you. Thanks especially to the people who stayed um, for this session. Um, and we'll be happy to take any questions. So uh, is this primarily designed for the, uh, like doing the FPGA processing is mostly for the inference systems or is it also like for training? Do you have this kind of TensorFlow to FPGA direct translation? Um, it's primarily targeted toward inference right now. And sorry, one follow-up is so the compiler is basically doing a C to RTL kind of translation under the hood. Um, yeah, and it's um, it's how would I put it? It's uh, I mean it uses the templates and um, it has a custom compiler. Um, we actually have um, one of the writers of DNN Weaver here in the audience who could probably answer even more detailed. Thank you. Of course. So where do you get the FPGA hardware from? Um, so we used uh, a Xilinx uh, CMU 1500. T uh, yeah. But in general, we are agnostic. So we can target KCU, so pretty much any sort of uh, FPGAs. So do you, do you set up your own servers with that? Or, or is there a I mean, this could be deployed on-prem as well. You know, the idea that you know, a user could you know, just use it. So it's not, it doesn't have to be on a cluster even.
I think that might be it for questions. Um, everyone, thank you very much for being here. Big round of applause for Blake and Bayram. Uh, fantastic talk. Thanks, guys.